Welcome to the broadcast. My name is John Mayfield, the real estate tech guy for Global Real Estate School. And my real estate exam coach, that's right, have a brand new uh, product I've just released entitled My Real Estate Exam Coach. I'm going to show you a little bit of that today. And we're actually going to be going over some flashcards and financing from that specific module as well. So I want to make sure that I am broadcasting loud and clear. It looks like I am. So let me just double check here. Looks like everything's going very well. So we are good to go and we will be ready to get right into the program. So I'm going to move over to my um, uh, laptop computer so you can see a couple of quick things. First of all, for those of you who are global real estate school students, I want to make sure that uh, you understand, I'm going to turn off the uh, Bluetooth here for a second. I want to make sure that you understand that uh, my, real, my real estate exam coach will be provided to you. If you want a copy of that, just let me know and I can get that to you. And uh, basically it will be in your course library. And a lot of times it's showing up, if you go in and, and work on it, it's showing up underneath the completed section. So I'm going to move right into my completed section here and show you that here's where the uh, program will be. These are broken down by the state material or the, pardon me, the exam material. So if... Um, if you're having trouble with financing, you can click on the financing module. It will bring you right into the course and you can begin the course and it's designed, I'll show you this in a little bit, it's designed for an iPad so you can actually um, use this on your iPad. You can see that in this specific module there are seven modules and I'm going to just kind of find out why my laptop is freezing up right there so we'll go back into financing and hit the begin and this should have that's a, not very good there is it uh, i don't know why the uh, financing is not pulling up and working there it is should be working okay and i don't know i'll have to do some checking here but I've been, might be the fact that, um, and I don't think so, I'll have to look that, that, so here's number one. I have not had this problem at all. Let's see, I did have, there we go, I think that was my problem. I did have the, um, the module with my computer screen a little bit bigger, but this will bring us back up here and you can see that um, here, if we begin the module, I can put this back over and then you can go right into the, the cards and take a look at all of that. So any of the modules you wanna go into, you can do that at any time, you can exit out. We'll make sure financing's working now that I have the screen reformatted so you can see here that I can go right in and begin taking a look at the information there's I'm adding audio I'm adding lots of information so just keep in mind that uh, we're still doing some some information and adding I have lots of short videos like this one here it is my real estate exam coach so yes I did some green screens but uh, uh, I think you'll find lots of really good information with the course and I'm excited to unveil it to you and we're going to actually use that today for our for our course but uh, if you want access to this just let me know I'm providing it free of charge to global real estate school students if you are watching and you are with a, another school and you'd like to have this uh, you can you can purchase it at globalrealestateschool.com and uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about is the fact that I'm adding podcast for all of the lessons so you can literally listen to these on your phone when you're driving to work if you're out exercising or walking but I 
I have designed this so that you'll be able to study each specific topic of the real estate exam. Now, I always want to speak positive. We never, we always want all of the students at Global Real Estate School to pass on the first attempt. But I realize sometimes that doesn't happen. And sometimes people don't pass a real estate exam on the first try. And if it's kind of interesting, if you pass, you, you don't receive any test scores. It just says, congratulations, you passed. And that's, that's what we want, right? If you don't pass, they do give you test scores. So they will give you scores in specific categories and, and let you know how well you did or did not do. And I've wanted a program because a lot of times people will tell me, hey, I did poorly in this specific topic. Well, now with, with, the, uh, with the course, you can actually go out here and if you did poorly, in leasing and property management, all of the information is there. If you did poorly in practice of real estate, you can go into practice of real estate and you'll notice uh, right here, every topic that PSI covers is covered within this specific module. So I really wanted to design something that would help students. Um, two, two, what, two reasons I designed this, number one, to help my students prepare and practice as they went along with the course material. So it's totally different than what you're learning in the classroom and their short videos. Uh, again, we have the podcast, we have lots of exam questions, a lot of interactivity. I also wanted something my students, so when they finish the course and there's that window between finishing my course and taking the exam, what additional information could you use that's presented in a different format to help you go in and pass that exam on the first time? So that was really my main goal. And the second outcome or goal of creating my real estate exam coach is um, to help students who are struggling in specific areas. Those folks who went and took the test and they didn't pass, and they, they're scoring poorly in a specific topic, they now can go right in and focus on that topic and, and uh, be good to go. So it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of videos, short videos, where I'm coaching you for the green screen, but I wanted just short, quick video tips to say, hey, they're gonna ask you this question. Here's how you need to know that. So uh, I think it's a really cool product and it's a product in, progress. Uh, I'm adding the podcast. We're adding uh, what I'm going to show you right now is going to be included some kind of a step up of the digital flashcards. So we're going to go over module 15. Oh, I just shouldn't say it's chapter 15 in my course, but it's the financing section. And specifically, we're going to go over uh, what I call f the flashcard modules. So we are gonna get into that right now. Now, this will actually allow you to see, this is what my program looks like if you're using a, um, a desktop. We'll go back out here so we can take a look at this. So this is what it would look like on a, an iPad if it was vertically an iPad, if, if you had the iPad, iPad horizontally. Here's what it would look like on your phone vertically, and this is what it would look like on your phone horizontally. So again, we have lots of flashcards, and I really designed this so that you can take it with you wherever you go. So that's, that's the goal of this. So I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to kind of make my screen a little bigger. That's the problem we had a minute ago because I want to make sure that you can see everything very well. And uh, I'm just going to go through this section on financing today. These are flashcards. This would be something you would, again, could take with you if, as you're studying. And, um, and because some of these... I blew my screen up. I say blew my screen up. I enlarged my screen. If I go too big, you might notice the um, it abbreviates over the, 
the wording, but it's no big deal. So let's talk about commercial banks, commercial banks. And here's what you need to remember for the exam. They rely heavily on demand deposits like checking and savings accounts, and they deal in short term commercial loans. In fact, that short term loans or commercial business loans, that's the question that I've heard or have seen in the past. Now, I mean, we have no idea what's on the test, but they may ask you what do, what's the main purpose of of um, of a commercial bank well they deal in short-term commercial business loans that's going to be more of a recall question if you were to see that so just keep that in mind let's go on over here to the next which is savings and loans they're really more generally concerned in residential so if i was having you highlight words or make just quick notes that you could see on to relate to answer test questions, commercial banks, short-term business loans. Although they make residential loans, my bank makes residential loans for the real estate exam, you wanna focus on commercial banks with that short-term business commercial loans. For savings and loans, I would focus on the residential home loans. That's kind of what um, kind of what savings and loans were all about was to help the flow of money and helping people be able to purchase real estate loans and to keep the housing inventory turning over with loans. And mutual savings banks, you could or could not see those. Similar to savings and loans, really uh, concerned with residential loans, but they're located in the northeastern part of the United States, okay? Now, from time to time, I'm gonna throw a little, one of these boxes in to, to kind of change things up for you and uh, make it look a little different, but uh, you need to know the difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage banker. So a mortgage broker works between a group of lenders and the borrower. So it's like a broker. They have lots of lenders they can go to and find the best rate or the best loan product for their customer. Where a mortgage banker is generally loaning money to a consumer, but it's, it's through their own funds and uh, sometimes they use other people's funds, but it's normally short-term or interim financing short-term or interim financing. Now, one of the neat things about the course is, you know, you, you can go through it at your own pace. So if you wanna keep hitting the continue button to go on through, you're welcome to do that. But I kind of added the continue button just to break up and give some, uh, some, some interesting um, uh, look and feel about the course. Credit unions, if you, again, these questions would probably be more recall questions. They're not going to be analyzing as we'll get into some of those here in a little bit. But a credit union, as you can see, they're generally member organizations or through members like labor unions. The, the National Realtors had a credit union for a short period of time. I actually joined the credit union and then they kind of for some reason left the credit union there was a problem there but so i have an account with the credit union it's now called northwestern financial credit union they're really making as you can see here short-term installment loans to their members but they do make some uh, real estate loans but they would normally be second mortgages and home improvement loans okay so credit unions again um, I think that would be fair, uh, uh, a fairly easy question for you to, to answer. Rural development loans, they uh, are part of the government. They're to farmers and low-income families, and they, they do loans that can either be directly provided by USDA or they could be guaranteed if a local lender was to make those loans. 
One of the things about a USDA loan, we do a lot of USD la USDA loans here in my area. They used to be called Farmers Home Administration. And I remember years ago um, doing a lot of what we called FMHA loans. It uh, was very popular. And uh, in my area where I'm located in Southeast Missouri, we have a lot of people who can afford the house payment, the monthly payment. It's just coming up with the down payment and all of the other obligations that are kind of tough. And, and we do have a lot of consumers in my area who um, unfortunately don't make a lot of income, but they want to be homeowners. So through the rural development USDA, they can either get a direct loan through USDA, but USDA has been more active the last few years, encouraging local banks to make the loan and then USDA guarantees the lender. So even though it is basically uh, uh, no money or very low money down payment, and you don't need to know all the specifics for that, what you do need to understand is USDA is dealing with um, lower income. There are, there are guidelines and limits on how much money a person can make, and those usually vary by county. Same with VA, veteran VA loans, and that USDA will make direct loans to consumers. They will also allow a local lender to make a loan, and they will guarantee that loan. So if the, the borrower was to default, then uh, USDA would guarantee that loan. So just keep that in mind. Then we have insurance companies, and insurance companies, you can see here, get involved in large-scale projects such as high-rise office buildings, shopping centers. They also purchase million-dollar blocks of home loans on the secondary market. Now, on your laptop, you'll see these are three across. Again, I designed this problem to, or designed this program to be more of a, of a mobile phone and you can see that they're going to stack up like this on your phone and you can just kind of take those and use your finger to read the topic and turn right back around. So uh, again, insurance companies, they're dealing really with more, um, more of the high-end properties, apartment complexes, shopping centers, and they buy and sell loans on the secondary market. We will talk about that here in just a little bit. So now I want to talk about the loan process, okay? And uh, I want you to remember the three C's, okay? Three C's. I talk about this in the class. First of all, the, your capability your capability. Can you pay the loan back? Now, the lender is normally going to look at what we call your debt to income ratios, uh, as well as your proposed debt, okay, house payment and all other expenses versus your income. So they're going to look at a couple of ratios here. And this is just a, what I call a process that we can go through. So the first debt to income ratio we're going to look at here is the lender's going to look at, and it could be anywhere from 26 to 28 percent. And basic they're, basically they're looking at what is your debt to income ratio on this first ratio. So. I'm just in, in the in the material I give you a very easy calculation. The first ratio is basically looking at what is the debt you currently have or the, the proposed house payment that you want to make versus your gross monthly income. So if you make a thousand dollars a month, and I again I'm just using this for simplicity's sake. They would look at the 28, let's just take the 28%, that first ratio. If you make $1,000 a month, then your proposed house payment should not exceed $280, okay? So 
if, and this is, you know, you have a good financial calculator. So if, if you, if $280, if this was, and I'm going to change this around to 80, is my payment and 30, if I was doing a 30 year, which is 360 months, and let's just say my interest is 4%, then I would just uh, plug in the PV, the principal value, and it says probably need to be looking for a home around $62,000. Does that make sense? So that's the first ratio the lender will look at. The second the second ratio you can see here deals with this 36 to 41 percent. And basically what the lender is saying is, okay, based on your credit report, now they're going to pull your credit report and see what those numbers are. Based on your credit report, here's all your monthly payments, your car payment, your credit cards, and all of these monthly expenditures. And if we take that number and we add the proposed house payment, remember, of $280, then your all of that together should not go over $410 if we're using that $1,000 a month rate, uh, figure. So every lender has different ratios and different guidelines. I mean, they're, they're right in there. FHA has their ratios and VA. Um, what I want you to know and you need to know for the examination is what we call these debt to income ratios. And that's going to be the first thing the lender is going to do is, are you capable of paying the loan back? If you're not, if your ratios are out of whack, then they're probably not going to be able to make the loan because they'll just say you need to pay off some of your credit cards before you qualify. So they'll look at your your gross income, and if you're husband and wife, they will take both of your incomes, put them together, and they'll use that to, de to determine if you're going to qualify for a loan. I think it's interesting. They never taught me that in school. <laughs> you know, the, the things that are so important, and I see lots of young couples that are not too far out of school, and they're married, and they want to buy a home, and Unfortunately, they don't understand some of these various um, qualification requirements, and that's going to be the first thing. Are you capable? So let's go on over to the next process here. The next C is your character. They're going to look at your character. And what we mean by that is they're going to look at a couple of things here. They're going to pull your credit report, okay? What's your credit score? Back in the mid-2000s, and, and I saw, a lot of us saw this coming in 2003 to 2005, lenders were making uh, loans to people who had credit scores of 525, sometimes even worse than that. Well, that has kind of stopped. And now you really need, although I hear some people that might be able to get a, a loan with a 575 or a 600 credit score, you really need to be around 625 or higher. And by the way, they will take both husbands and wives and they will uh, average those two and take usually uh, they'll take the lower, if they look at both credit scores, they might take the lower, have to work off the lower score. But they're going to look at your, um, your character, which, which your credit score is going to tell a lot about I, your character. Now, to me, this is just my opinion as, as an instructor, okay? I think that there are some problems with credit scoring today. I really do. I think that uh, there are some things people get hurt on their credit score, which... They shouldn't be. I mean, if you want to apply for a car loan or, or something and you're just kicking the tires, why should that bring your credit score down? It's just my, again, that's my opinion. I think there are some problems and things with, with credit, with the credit reporting and the credit scoring today. But needless to say, you got to have a good credit score. And, and generally, the better the credit score, the better interest rates you can get. 
And we see that with car loans. I mean, they advertise 0%, but you got to have a good credit score to qualify for one of those good good car, you know, the 0%. If you go in and your credit score is a little beat up, you're going to pay a higher, a higher rate. So they're going to look at your credit score. And the other two factors that are really important here that I like to stress is they look at your job history and they look at the borrower's residence history. I've seen people in the past that their job history was every four or five months they were changing jobs. That doesn't look good to a lender. They want somebody that's got a little bit of stability and usually a minimum of one year on your job is very important. Now, if you are an RN, a nurse, and you change your job, you know, you've switched hospitals three times over a two year period or four year period, that's not going to be too much of a problem because you, you are in the same profession. But if you're changing job professions every three or four months, that may not look very good when you qualify for the loan. Same way with renting. If, if you've lived six places over the last two years, it might not look very good. It's funny, my wife and I, the first two years we were married, we moved like six or eight times. We were flipping houses long before HGTV came along. And uh, my wife would decorate our homes and re we would remodel them and she'd decorate them and they'd look like a magazine. And before we left for work, we always had our home in tip top shape and showing shape. And I would be out showing property and I knew the buyers wouldn't find anything they would like. And I would say, come on over, let me show you our house. And my wife would come home to a candlelight dinner and I would say, honey, I sold the house today. But um, we enjoyed doing that. But that luckily I had local lenders who knew me, but that normally if you're renting and you're moving a lot, doesn't look real good. And that could be a situation. So they're going to they're gonna send out loan verifications for your work to verify that you work there. And same way with your landlord. And if you're not paying your rent on time or you're always late and the landlord or the property manager reports that, could have a negative or a detrimental impact on uh, being able to get your loan. So they're going to look at your um, uh, your character. Remember, our first C was your uh, your um, our first th C. Well, we were on debt to income, so we're, the first C was character, and then the next C is collateral. Capability was the first C. I needed to go back one additional slide. But the collateral, and generally, you need 20% down. Now, there is an exam question, and we'll talk about this in a little bit later, but if you do not have 20% to put down, then the lender might require you to take out what is called private mortgage insurance. It insures the lender in case the borrower defaults on the loan. Why do they have to do that? It's a lot different to foreclose on a home. We're going to go over that in just a little bit versus for repossessing an automobile. The car, they can just come to your driveway in the middle of the night and back the wrecker up and take off with it or go to your work. But with a home, there's some legal issues that have to go through, kind of like evicting a tenant. Um, so they're going to look at the collateral. That's an important part, and uh, we need to know that. And then finally, this has been an exam question here lately. I would make sure you understand this. Once all the paperwork is documented, the credit report, the job verification, the landlord verification, the bank statements, the appraisal, all of that stuff's been done. The file goes to what is called an underwriter. And the underwriter is a final say-so before it goes to closing. So make sure you know who the underwriter is. So with this course, you know, these kinds of things, and I've done this with my real estate exam coach, uh, you can walk through and just swipe and and again, this is all designed. So if you're on a mobile phone, um, that's what it would look like right there. And you can read this information and um, go right on over to the next section and uh, read that and study while you're on lunch break at work. Or sometimes if you're like me and you're just 
Uh, my wife goes into a store and I decide to stay out in the car f to read or something. I, now you can study for the exam. Okay, uh, I don't think I missed anything I wanted to go over there. Now, one last thing I want to mention though before we move on with regards to the loan process. And this is just, this probably isn't on the exam, but it's just for your benefit. A couple of things I always tell borrowers. This is when you get your license and you're working with buyers. Uh, if there's a skeleton in your closet, just let me know or let the lender know in advance. It's a lot easier to deal with those skeletons up front than to try to hide them and they fall out of the closet midway down the, the, the loan process, okay? So just if there's something lurking in your past or something that's gone on with a landlord or just Explain that up front. Very good. Have your buyers do that. Number two, don't go out and buy anything until after the loan closes because lots of times the underwriter will go in and pull a credit report right before closing. And I have seen buyers who've gone out and bought a car, bought furniture for their, for their home, uh, their new home, and then the lender pulls a new credit report. They see these new monthly obligations on their credit report. And when they calculate those debt to income ratios, guess what happens? They don't qualify for the loan. And I have seen lots of deals go south because the lender went in and pulled a credit report right before closing and they did not qualify. So you got to make sure that you instruct your buyer don't go out and borrow any money or do anything that might mess your credit up until after the loan closes. And number two, if you know of something or you have something, just let us know in advance. We all have hospital bills. We all might have a collection on something that's come up that we're disputing. It's just easier to deal with those if the lender can know about those in advance. Okay, just a couple of quick things. All right. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, this time we're going to look at the note, the mortgage, and the deed of trust. And I'm just going to flip these over. The note, it's the, uh, the financing instrument. It shows evidence of the debt. See that? It shows evidence of the debt. It's going to have things like the interest rate, the number of years. But what two things I really want you to know about the note, it's... Um, it shows evidence there's a debt and it's a financing instrument, okay? The mortgage and the deed of trust, those are what we use to secure the property and it depends on what state you're in. For example, a mortgage, as you study in the course, has how many parties? Two. A deed of trust has how many parties? Three. Good job, excuse me, just a second here. So the mortgage, again, secures the property. There are two parties. We have a mortgagor, the borrower, and the mortgagee, the, the lender. With a deed of trust, we have three parties. And the three parties are the trustor, who's the borrower. We also have the trustee who's this third party it's normally the bank's attorney a lot of times in my because i'm a small community it's the attorney at the title company that the bank uses but a lot of times it's the bank's attorney and then we have a beneficiary who is the lender now the trustee's job two two really main points the trustee does if you want to write this down the trustee will foreclose on the property if you don't abide by the terms of the, the security instrument. We're going to talk about some of those things in a minute. That's job number one. The second job the trustee has is um, they have to issue what's called a deed of release when the, the loan is paid in full. So when you pay off the loan, you want to get a deed of release and you want to have that recorded at the courthouse because remember, recording does what? It's constructive notice to the whole world. There's no longer a lien on that property. 
the the lender is going to record the the um, the security document, the deed of trust. They're going to record that and the note because and sometimes they record the note. I, I have to double check on that, but and you don't need to know that for the exam, but you need to know that the note is a financing instrument and the deed of trust is the security instrument. I don't think they always record the note because, and they might in some situations, but um, that has a lot of other information there that sometimes, you know, that could or couldn't be. And I'll just have to check on that. But I, I will check and get you that information next week, okay? I promise on that. Um, but I'm thinking the note does not get recorded. but again they're going to record the deed of trust or the mortgage because that's going to show to the whole world there's a lien on the property and generally it will be a first deed of trust a senior lien as we will talk about but so the trustee really has two jobs uh, foreclose if need be if you violate any of the terms i hate to just say if you don't make your mortgage payments, because there's a lot more than that. If you don't keep insurance on it, they could foreclose. If you don't pay your taxes, they could foreclose. If you start housing hazardous waste, they could foreclose. There's lots of little things in the in the deed of trust that and the mortgage that you have to abide by as the borrower. So deed of trust, three parties, trustor, trustee, and a beneficiary. Trustor is the borrower, trustee is that third party, they're going to foreclose and issue a deed of release when you pay it off, and the beneficiary is the lender. So you, you know the lender gives you the money in return for you creating this deed of trust, this trust, naming them as the beneficiary, so that if for some reason you don't follow all the rules, they can accelerate the payments due and payable, and begin the foreclosure proceedings. Now with a mortgage, there are two parties, a mortgagor and a mortgagee. Mortgagor is the borrower, that's how I remember it, and the mortgagee is lending the money. Um, in that situation, and we're gonna look at that in just a minute, there are only two parties, but it gets a little bit more complicated with foreclosure, and foreclosure can take a little bit more time because you usually have to go through court to, to foreclose. With the deed of trust, we have this uh, power of sale clause that's included with the deed of trust, which means they can accelerate the payments due and payable, run some ads in the newspaper for a certain length of time, and then go to the courthouse steps and sell the property. That's what we use here in Missouri. But just for the exam, remember who those parties are and remember the number of parties. Remember that your note's the financing instrument. It shows evidence of the debt and the mortgage and the deed of trust are used as security. Now, you're not gonna use both the mortgage and the deed of trust. It just depends on what state. It, some states will use a mortgage. Some states, like in Missouri, we use a deed of trust. Found an interesting website and I'll show you that. Uh, in just a moment, we'll pull that up, and it'll show you what states actually um, do, uh, all, what states are what. So we'll take a look at that here in a moment. Now, this is an important note. You need both the note and the mortgage to have an enforceable mortgage loan, okay? On the test, this phrase right here can be confusing. The mortgagor, the borrower, is the person who gives the mortgage to the lender. I know that seems confusing, but if I'm going to give you money, I may have a string attached to that money that says, I'll give you the money, but <laughs> you have to sign this mortgage, this security instrument, and, and give it back to me, okay? So, you know, just keep in mind when you see this on the exam, understand that it is the mortgagor, the borrower who actually gives a mortgage. I mean, I always wanna think, well, wouldn't it be the lender who gives you the mortgage? Well, yeah, they draft it all up and 
have their attorney or title company prepare it. But when you sign that mortgage, when you sign it, you're actually giving it to the lender, okay? And saying, thanks for the money, and here's your mortgage. Here's your security. Remember, the, the mortgage is the security instrument. So thank you, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Bank, for the money. Now I'm going to give you this mortgage I just signed, which is a security instrument. They will word it that way on the exam. You just need to know that. I think that's very important. Okay. I always wonder if there's other real estate instructors who are watching me now and they're wondering, well, that's not the way I explain that. But anyway, uh, I guess we are all entitled to our own opinion. My pass rates have been very good, so I'm going to be happy. Uh, but you can always send me an email if I, should, if I should pronounce something differently. Now, here are the two lean. This, this gets into foreclosure. We have what's called a lean theory state and a title theory theory state. And I'm going to read this to you, and you can read it on the screen here, hopefully. In a lean theory state, in lean theory states, the buyer, who is also the borrower, will hold the deed to the real estate property for the life of the mortgage. The buyer promises to make payments on the mortgage according to the terms spelled out in the financing agreement. The mortgage agreement serves as the lender's lien on the property until the loan is paid back completely. But the buyer holds the title to the property instead of the lender. So you see here the lender's going to actually have to go to court to get this title back because the buyer holds the title. The lien is extinguished when the loan is paid in full. Now, that again is a lien theory state. I'm going to jump over here and I probably could find this. I might be able to find this a different way. Here we go. Oh, I was wanting to, the one right here. This is where I found this, which I thought was very interesting. So lean theory states, you can see Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa. By the way, we're approved in Indiana. We've got some students there in Indiana. Uh, Iowa, Kansas, we approve our schools over in Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, New Mexico, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, we're approved there. You can get your license. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Vermont, Wisconsin. Okay, those are all lean theory states. Now, it's interesting, Florida's on the list. We have this really cool app, and I go over this in my practice course to show you on valuation. I think it's a, a great video, and I encourage you to watch it. I know it's lengthy, but uh, it will help you price property when you get your real estate license. But it also shows you distressed properties and so forth. It's interesting when I pull up uh, my RPR when I'm speaking in Florida, I'll pull it up in different areas. And I was just in a place called Marco Island, beautiful location, and they, um, there was a bunch of foreclosed properties in that area. And I thought that's interesting because, you know, why are there so many? And then it dawned on me, Florida is a lean theory state, which means you have to go to court in order to foreclose on the property and get it back. Sometimes that can take a year. And I mention in the notes, why? Because if you have to go to court, there's setting a court date, there are delays, it can just be a lengthy, lengthy process. So lien theory states, again, the mortgage, the key point here is that the buyer, who's also the borrower, will hold the deed to the real estate property for the life of the mortgage. And we drop down here and it says um, here that, uh, right here, the buyer holds a title to the property. Now, in Missouri, we are a title theory state, 
And notice it says, in these jurisdictions, the lender conveys the title to the buyer, who will then issue a deed of trust, naming the lender or the mortgagee as the beneficiary, just what we talked about, of the trust. The title to the property is held by a third party, the trustee, who given the power to foreclose, remember I said they had two jobs, should the buyer fail to comply with the terms of the mortgage agreement, now we talked about terms, rights of ownership and possession reside within the buyer according to the ter terms of the deed of trust. When the loan is completely satisfied, the lender issues and records a deed of reconveyance, and that's the trustee who normally will prepare that and do that in favor of the borrower who will have a clear title to the property. The deed of reconveyance removes any interest that the lender may have in the property. So again, we use that in Missouri, and you can see title theory states right here uh, that, that use that as well. It it's just really gets down to this. In a lien theory state, it's probably going to take the lender a little bit longer to foreclose versus a title theory state. But in a lien theory state, you can kind of see that that title is actually issued in the buyer's name, isn't it? Where in a title theory state, um, the buyer, it's through that deed of trust that they actually have the, their, their rights and there's the lien on the property. Uh, so kind of look over those. You can go through that and understand that. Hypothecate means to pledge property as collateral without giving up possession of the property. And a good example would be like an automobile loan, uh, your home loan. That's hypothecate. You've got to know the definitions. That's why I'm doing the flashcards. Now, let's go through some of these. Do on sale clause. It's also known as the acceleration clause. If you try to sell your property without the bank's permission, for example, you let somebody take over your payments and you just say, hey, take over my payments, make payments to the lender, and when, when it's paid off, I'll give you the deed to the property and issue you a deed. Or if you sometimes do what's called a contract for deed, the acceleration clause or the due on sale clause allows the lender to call the note due and payable. A subordination clause just changes lien priorities. And I know that seems weird, but um, if you are a second lien and someone's in a third lien, they can do a subordination clause where they change priorities. For example, I use, this, I use this example. I told you my wife and I remodeled a lot of homes when we were first married. And Ameren Union Electric, they used to be called Union Electric. It's now called Ameren. I think they've had several name changes. But they had a really cool program at one time where you could insulate your home and you could update your heating and air conditioning and they would pay for, I mean, they would loan you the money and give you 100% financing. So one time my wife and I, we, we did that on most of the houses we were flipping because it was a great way. It was very inexpensive. The payments were real low. So we'd bought this really cute home out in the country on five acres. And we had our first mortgage through the savings and loan. And we f uh, insulated the home had new insulation put in because the house needed a total rehab and we it had an old floor furnace i remember that and we took the floor furnace out and we put in a heat pump central air conditioning and a heat pump central heating insulated it very well and so we have the first mortgage through ozarks federal savings and loan and we had the second mortgage through amarin uh, through union electric we found this home in town we really wanted to buy. I, sh I went through it on property tour. That was back in the day when uh, in my area, we would all meet for breakfast at a local place and have breakfast. And then we were all allowed to put one property on the property tour. They were different offices. And so uh, we met for breakfast. We went on property tour. And I remember a home, Norman Mason, a good friend of mine, 
who uh, still has his real estate license and uh, is a very active in our Realtor Association. Norman had this home and I just fell in love with it. It was a story and a half. It was in a great neighborhood, but I mean, it needed a lot of work. And I, I told my wife, I said, we've got to go look at this house. And she fell in love with it. And um, we were like, we want to buy that home. Well, we had enough equity in our property that Ozarks Federal was willing to make us a loan on that home so we could go ahead and buy it and keep, keep our existing home. However, they needed to do a second, the, a second deed of trust on our home with five acres with, that had the Ameren or the Union Electric loan. So Ozarks Federal's in the first position, Union Electric's in the second, and Ozarks Federal says, we'll make you the loan on this new home, but we need a second on the home out in the country. Well, Union Electric had a second deed of trust. However, they were really good to subordinate. So Union Electric subordinated to a third position and Ozarks Federal went to a second position. We were able to buy the home in town, fix it up, and we immediately put our house in the country up for sale and we sold it and paid off Union Electric and paid off our second deed of trust. But that's a good example of subordination. It was just, a, it was Union Electric who had a second deed of trust for the heating and air conditioning and insulation agreed to subordinate to a third position to allow Ozarks Federal to have not only a first mortgage, but a second mortgage, okay? So that's what uh, subordination is. Release and defeasance clause, and, and I like for you to remember defeasance, it's a defeated. That's just when you pay the note off. Uh, they will issue either a deed of release, they call it a deed of reconveyance in a, in a trust deed state. If you're using a mortgage, you could see a satisfaction piece. Means the same thing, just understand that a uh, satisfaction piece deed of release, deed of reconveyance, that's all part of the clause in the uh, mortgage or trust deed that says we'll release the note when you pay it off. Subrogation clause, I just like to remember substitution of a third party. A lot of times, the easiest way for me to, uh, this is a clause that's in your mortgage or deed of trust and basically uh, what this means is you can you agree to allow the lender to be substituted into your shoes if they need to go out and try to collect a claim and you in in place of you now this is a good example of an automobile situation normally if you have full coverage insurance with your automobile and you are in an automobile accident there's a dispute your insurance company will go ahead and pay your claim to you so you can go on and get a new car, or get your car fixed. And then there's a subrogation clause in your insurance policy where the lender says, now we can, we've already paid you your money, so now we can go out and try to recollect our money from that person whose fault it was. And if we collect that money, it's coming to us instead of you because we've substituted ourselves in, in your shoes since we've already paid you off. So that's all subrogation is. It's just substitution of a third party. Now there are going to be other clauses in the deed of trust and mortgage, but they're clauses that I think you'll be able to pick up on. Assignment of rents, basically if you're renting your property and you're and they're foreclosing and you leave town or whatever, the bank could go over to the to the property and say, "Hey, uh, Mayfield's not paying his payments, so you're going to start making your payments to the bank directly." So there are some other clauses. I didn't include those here because they basically describe in their definition uh, what what the purpose is of those clauses. So just remember, you'll see some other clauses um, in the in the uh, mortgage or the deed of trust. I'm looking down and we've gone uh, 54 minutes. So we've got a few more things and I'm gonna just keep going if that's okay. Um, points, 
that you're going to have some questions on points. And notice points charged by a lender can either be in the form of a discount point or fees or an origination fee or po origination points. Or you usually call it origination fees. And here's what you need to remember. Take a note. One point equals 1% of the loan amount. Now, trust me, it won't be that easy on the test. They will doctor the question up to where they're going to want you to calculate points, but they're going to give you a sales price and a loan to value ratio and all kinds of other gobbledygook in that question that will be kind of mind boggling and big and thick and lots of stuff. And it's your job to say, okay, Mr. Exam Writer, you're going to try to trip me up, but my instructor, John Mayfield from Global Real Estate School, my real estate exam coach, told me never ever calculate discount points or origination fees on the sales price. I only calculate my points and fees, origination fees, on the loan amount. Okay, so one point equals 1% of the loan amount, of the loan amount. And remember, they will doctor the question up to make you dig a little deeper to discover how much was the loan. Discount points are really, pre, it's really prepaid interest. And it increases the lender's yield on the loan. And we'll talk about that. Origination fees cover the paperwork. Do you see that right there? So don't forget discount points, prepaid interest. It increases the lender's yield. I should add the word profit there. And origination fees paperwork. All right. Summary, one point equals 1% of the loan amount, not the sales price. And read the questions carefully. So look at this example here. Let's take this. A $100,000 loan, the lender charges two discount points. How much in points is the borrower going to pay? Well, basically, it's just 100,000 times 0 0.02, 2%, right? 0 0.02, and that is going to be $2,000. I'm going to double check my math here. Times 0 0.02, $2,000. Now, remember I said discount points increase the lender's yield or the profit on the loan they make to borrowers. In the above example, the lender is only out of pocket $98,000. Remember, you took out a $100,000 loan, but you had to give them $2,000 in discount points. So the lender's really only out 98,000. They gave you 100,000 and you gave them $2,000 in return. The borrower though is paying back the loan based on $100,000. Therefore, the lender's making a higher interest rate than what is shown on the note. And that's why we have things like truth and lending and all these other things that go on, okay? So just remember this when we talk about discount points and origination fees. One point equals 1% of the loan amount. Do never figure it on the sales price and just trust my, trust my words. They're going to make you dig to find out what that loan amount is. They could give you the loan amount and the problem, but chances are they'll give you the sales price and they'll give you a loan to value ratio. So just take the sales price times the loan to value ratio and find out what the 
the loan amount is, or they may give you the sales price and tell you they're going to pay $20,000 down. Figure out what the loan amount is first, then figure your discount points. Remember that one point equals 1% 1 of the loan amount. And discount points are really prepaid interest. It's really prepaid interest. It increases the lender's yield or profit on the loan. An origination fee is just a fee they're charging to cover your paperwork. That's why you should always shop around for your loan because every lender charges different points and different loans. And I've seen some people that go on the internet and get loans and the points and the fees they pay are astronomical. So you always want to check and ask questions and, and ask them, can you remove those points or origination fees? You can negotiate those types of things as well. Hopefully you understand how that works here. Now, judicial foreclosure, this is when uh, it's overseen by the court and it can take a little bit more time. We talked about that in the lien theory state, right? In a non-judicial foreclosure, remember there's that power of sale. The trustee can return the property through the beneficiary. So uh, it's much quicker and it's done through what's called the power of sale clause that's found in the trust deed. So judicial foreclosure, you're gonna have to go to court. It's gonna take a little bit more time normally found in lien theory states, non-judicial foreclosure. Uh, it's just what it says, it's non-judicial. It has that power of sale clause in the deed of trust can be a lot quicker. Now, equitable right of redemption, redemption, statutory right of redemption, and deed in lieu of foreclosure. The equitable right of redemption is the right to get the property back before, that's the key word there, before the sale. And it's basically this. And I had this happen one time. It was not to me personally, but I was involved in it. Uh, I had a friend of mine who's a great guy and has, has a lot of money. And he came to me and said, a friend of mine owns a farm and the bank's foreclosing on them uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. I want to pay his farm loan out off for him. This was a number of years ago and it was several hundred thousand dollars. And he went and got a cashier's check. He knew how much it was and that they needed to stop the foreclosure sale. And I took it over to the bank and paid it off, paid off the loan. And it stopped the foreclosure sale. That was those borrowers equitable right in the the equitable right of redemption. That is a person's right, if they win the lottery or if they come into a lot of money or they have a friend, as this person did, who wants to go over and pay off that loan before foreclosure sale, that's your equitable right of redemption. Now, statutory right of redemption is the right to buy back the property after the sale. See that? Um, it's very complicated. You're not going to have to get that in depth for the real estate exam. What you just need to know is equitable, equitable right is the right before the sale and statutory is the right after the sale. Some states will allow you the right to go and purchase your property back up to a year after the foreclosure sale. And you have, there's lots of things that, you know, the, the bid goes to the highest bidder at the sale who's willing to take the lowest interest rate. If the, stat, if the statutory right of redemption was to be executed. Lots of weird things like that, and you don't want to do a lot of work to the property until it's yours free and clear. Uh, a lot of times you find that with tax sales as well. There's a statutory right of redemption. You don't need to know all of that for the exam. You do need to know that equitable is before the sale happens, statutory after. The sale. And then deed in lieu of foreclosure, also called the friendly foreclosure, is a process where the lender allows the borrower to give back the property through a deed. Now, a lot of people don't like to do friendly foreclosures. 
a lot of banks would just as soon foreclose because if I deed the property back to you and you say, oh, just deed it back to us, John, you're going to take all the baggage that is associated with that property that I may have. In other words, remember that property I said where I had uh, the first with, with Ozark and the second with Ozark and the Ameren, the Union Electric had a third. Well, Ozark wouldn't have wanted to do a friendly foreclosure if I got in trouble because they would, they would have rather foreclosed to force Union Electric to either pay up and pay off the loans. And we'll talk about this here in just a second. So they would rather just foreclose and wipe everything clean and get the property back with a clean slate. And it also would allow them to be able to get a deficiency judgment against me if they can't pay the property, if they can't resell the property for all of the costs that they're going to be out. So for the exam, deed in lieu of foreclosure, friendly foreclosure, it's just a way where a defaulting bor borrower can deed the property back to the to the lender. A lot of lenders don't like to do that. I should have added here, and I didn't, but a short sale, there have been some questions on short sales, and you need to know about a short sale. A short sale is when the borrower, unfortunately, owes more than what the market value is on the property. And sometimes lenders will allow the borrower to go on and sell it, so I'm going to give you an example here. Let's say I own a home that's worth a hundred thousand, or that I have a loan that's a hundred thousand, but the market value says my house is only worth eighty thousand, and there's no way I can sell my home, pay the commission, all the expenses, and pay off the hundred thousand dollar note. So the lender will allow sometimes, and you have to get the lender's approval, a short sale that says, okay, go on and sell it, and we'll take $70,000. If that's all you're going to net is $70,000 after paying commission and your expenses, we'll accept that and allow you to do what is called a short sale. Now, does the lender just say, you know, the $30,000 can, what happens in that scenario? They may issue you a 1099 for the $30,000, and you will have to pay capital gains tax on that 30000 or report that on your, your income, they might even be able to come back and collect that as a deficiency judgment. You need to um, make sure that if you or one of your clients or customers are doing a short sale, that you, uh, remember I said client or customer, if you have a written listing agreement, you have a client, right? But I wanted to stress the point that a customer, you don't have anything in writing with them, a client you do, but you need to encourage them to seek legal counsel and seek tax counsel and ask questions from the lender and get the requirements for that short sale and have them go to their attorney and their accountant and get advice from them. We never can do that as a real estate professional, and we shouldn't because that's out of our that's out of our league. But that's what a short sale is, and I need to add that, and I will include that here in the information because that topic has been coming up on the exam. Now, order of payment at a foreclosure sale. Here's how the monies are dispersed. First, the costs, the fees, and the expenses of the foreclosure sale. Second, property taxes and all special assessments. Don't forget, we talk about this in the tax chapter. Um, property taxes get paid first at a foreclosure sale. Well, you can see the cost and fees of the sale will get paid, but the, the property taxes are in all special assessments because that's a tax. Then the first mortgage is going to get paid or the sen what we call a senior mortgage. And then all the junior liens, and remember, in the order of their date and time of recording. And this has been a question. They give you a question, everybody's paid. Who gets the money if there's any money left over? Well, the defaulting borrower would get any monies that are left over. Now, if the property does not sell for a sufficient sum to cover the cost, fees, and obligations owed, 
then the lender can get what is called a deficiency judgment. There's that word judgment, and that can be issued against the defaulting borrower. Remember from the chapter on encumbrances, a judgment attaches to both real and personal property. So don't forget that, okay? Real and personal property. Um, so we are an hour and 10 minutes over. I'm going to pick up on this next week if that's okay, because this gets into another area. Um, but we talk about Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, Freddie Mac. They're all on the secondary mortgage. And then I'm going to get into a lot of various different loans that we could go through. Uh, private mortgage insurance, we talked about that already. If you don't put 20% down, I probably can go through these very quickly. Fixed rate loan, I think you understand that. Same interest rate throughout the life of the loan. An adjustable rate mortgage is going to go up or down. I give you some information here about payment caps, lifetime caps, indexes. We talk about that in the course. A graduated payment mortgage, it's going to graduate and go up over the life of the loan. So you're going to start out with a lower payment, but that's going to build up. A balloon note is where the loan's amortized over the full length of the property, but at some point it's going to come due and payable. So it may be amortized over 20 years, but it's going to balloon in three years. And that allows you to have a smaller payment. Can be a dangerous loan, so you need to know that because the lender could just call it due and payable. Growing equity mortgage, just you're going to be paying more toward the principal. A RAM or a reverse annuity mortgage, these are popular with seniors because it's kind of reversed. It's the exact opposite of a conventional loan because the lender is actually paying you monthly payments based on your equity. But at some point, that's going to run out. And you see a lot of TV ads there. Remember, a straight loan is interest only. They love this question on the exam. So make sure you know that interest only. Participation financing is where the lender participates. A package mortgage just packages up um, furniture and real and personal property. Wraparound loan. Open in is like a future advance deed of trust. You can go and borrow your equity at any time. Um, it's a great mortgage to have. Buy down. Normally developers will buy your interest rate down for you and they encourage you to go into their uh, development. Installment sales, similar to a contract for deed or a land contract, and we'll talk about those next week. Um, construction loan, it's interim financing and you have a takeout loan at the end. So again, I'm going to go back over these next week. Blanket loan, normally developers will use this in a subdivision. So when one parcel is sold, you have to get a partial deed of release. And then a sell lease back, kind of an interesting concept where you actually sell your property and then lease it back. It's normally seen in industrial or, or commercial properties when somebody needs, needs to raise some funds. So um, that's a lot of information on financing. And I'm going to take this that, I, this that I've created and I'm going to put this in your dashboard. Uh, actually reach out to me. I'll be slowly putting this uh, in your dashboard. There's a... Um, there's another site that I provide you as a student of Global Real Estate School that you will get a link and a password to. It's, I don't want to confuse you because it's a totally different website than what you're on now. With my real estate school, you're in what's called a learning management system, which tracks your time. And, and I get charged per person that's inside that learning management system, which is called Litmus. Many of you have downloaded their app. And so um, for some of the free stuff I'm giving you outside of the school, that's at my Business Tech Guy University site. And I don't get charged per students there. 
but I don't want to confuse you with login information. So if you want access to this, send me an email. If you're one of my students, I'll put this in your dashboard at Global Real Estate School. And also, if you want access to this My Real Estate Exam Coach, I need to add this into your dashboard as well. Just send me an email. I'm trying to go through and add all of the new students who will be getting this uh, temporarily. I'd love your feedback. There are some glitches and some little issues, so it's kind of a soft rollout, and any feedback you could give me would be appreciated. But again, if you want this in the Global Real Estate School, just send me an email and I can add that in to, to that. But I uh, hope this was helpful for you today. I am going to start doing the live streaming at 4 p.m. on Thursdays, okay? Because number one, I just feel like I have a little bit more energy than 8 o'clock at night because I, I mean, I'm like you. I'm selling real estate. I'm working on my school. Lots of things going on. But um, I, I will always send everyone a link to the recording. As soon as we finish, I'm shooting that out to everybody. But um, four o'clock, so when I'm going to try to do these, I think it'll be a little bit easier. And we may go for an hour and 20 or 30 minutes. Block that out, and then I'll send it to you. And if you can't watch it at four o'clock, you can always watch it that night as part of your, part of your study session. I did a, a live streaming last, just a couple of days ago on the amortization table. It's very, very important you watch that video. I had several students who are still getting emails from me who've already passed their exam. They said, John, it was spot on. We saw questions, two or three questions from that amortization table. And I had one girl who unfortunately didn't pass the test. And she told me, she said, John, that, that table really cleared it up for me and helped me out. So thank, she said, Thank you, thank you, thank you three times for the video. So watch that video. It's on the amortization table. It's also on my YouTube channel. I encourage you to sign up for that. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, search for Global Real Estate School because tomorrow at 4 o'clock I'm planning to try to do another live stream because some of the live streaming I'm doing, I can pull some of this off and reuse it in some other parts of my courses. So the audio and other parts. So be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Global Real Estate School students and others. Reach out to me if you ever have any questions. If you're watching this and you're not a student, you want to subscribe to My Real Estate Exam Coach, go over to Global Real Estate School. We also have digital flashcards. We have practice exams. Um, I have podcasts. We'd just love for you to follow us and be a subscriber and, and reach out to us. Give me a Give me a a positive review and a thumbs up if you would as well. So thanks for watching this. Uh, have a great evening if you're watching and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and I will talk to you soon. So thanks again for watching. Have a great day.